Good evening, everyone. My name is Maine Castillo, and I'm Town Hall's program manager. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Elliott Bay Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation of Marcus Harrison Green in conversation with Michelle Matassa Flores. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for joining us in person or tuning in online. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity. We're adding new events and podcasts every day. October brings Becoming Abolitionists, author Jerika Purnell with Nikita Oliver and Darnell Moore, the first concert in our in-person Global Rhythm series with musical guest Ketz Azal, Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us tonight by donating or becoming a member. Visit our website for more info. But back to this evening's event. Tonight's presentation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To streamline our audience experience, we've changed the Q&A platform for our events. To submit your question, please use your phone or computer to enter app.meet.ps forward slash mhgreen. We'll drop this link in the chat, and when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll remind folks again where to go. We can't guarantee we'll get to every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. <laughs> For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for rewatching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, the Office, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, the Nestholm Family Foundation, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member support organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight and at home. Lastly, you'll want to dive deeper into this evening's topic by purchasing a copy of the author's book. Please use the link in the chat below to order through Elliott Bay Books or visit our bookseller table here at Town Hall to pick up a copy of the book. Here tonight to introduce Marcus and Michelle is Sharon Nairi Williams. Sharon is a storyteller and a community builder. Her list of Seattle bona fides includes the founder of the Mahogany Project, the current director of Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas, former member of the Seattle Arts Commission, and friend and colleague to Marcus Harrison Green. Please welcome Sharon Nairi Williams. Good evening. Thank you for that intro. I think I'm gonna add the friend to Marcus Harrison Green to all my intros um, here on out. Um, it is, I'm so happy to see everyone and it's an honor and privilege to be with you here today. And my job is to introduce these lovely people that will be talking to you for an hour. And I'm gonna start with the interviewer. I just met her tonight, but I know that because she is a friend of Marcus, she's cool people. Um, Michelle Matassa Flores became executive editor for the Seattle Times in 2019. In, tw in 26 years with the Seattle Times, Matassa Flores worked in or has supervised nearly every department in the newsroom. She's a bad woman, no yeah. doubt. Uh, first hired by the Seattle Times in 1988, she served as a reporter, deputy business editor, code Metro Editor, Deputy Investigations Editor, Features Editor, Assistant Managing Editor for Sports, and Features and Deputy Managing Editor. She is an editor. <laughs> Real editor. Do not get it twisted. Um, she left the company in 2008, taking on leadership roles with the Seattle News website, Crosscut, and the Puget Sound Business Journal. Then she returned to the Times in 2013 and served as managing editor for, from 2016 to her appointment as executive editor. <laughs> <laughs> Flores describes herself journalism junkie, proud mom, and West Seattleite. Oh, and 
a loyal organ duck. She, she put it here, I didn't say it. Um, that's what they told me to say. You deal with her with that, okay? Um, now, my friend, Marcus Harrison Green. Uh, oh, y'all can get louder than that. Now, he's the publisher of the South Seattle Emerald and a columnist with the Seattle Times. Growing up in South Seattle, he experienced firsthand the impact of one-dimensional stories on marginalized communities, which taught him the value of authentic narratives. After an unfulfilling stint in the investment world during his 20s, Marcus returned to his community with a newfound purpose of telling stories with nuance, complexity, and multidimensionality with the hope of advancing social change. This led him to become a writer and found the South Seattle Emerald. Oh. Because I'm his friend, yo, y'all can give him love as much as you want to. In addition, Marcus has been a past board member of the Western Washington chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists and a recipient of Crosscut's Courage Award for Culture. He was named one of Seattle's most influential people by Seattle Magazine in 2016. And get this, he was awarded the Seattle Human Rights Commission's Individual Human Rights Leader Award for 2020. If it wasn't COVID, I would grab the mic and drop it. But in addition to that, what the bio doesn't say, and if you read between the lines, you can figure it out. Marcus is about community and helping the community get the stories that are necessary and not are, none of them are necessary traditional. And that's what I love about my friend. If I call him and he said, you had me at community. And I was like, okay, let's do the daggone thing. And that's what I love about Marcus. His smile is infectious, right? He show you them teeth. And tonight he got on his suit with these shiny shoes. I'm sorry, all you virtual folks, you don't get to see that in person, but my brother is clean. Marcus Harrison Green's book of essays, Readying to Rise, is the subject of this evening's presentation. I hope y'all are ready. Marcus has a long history with Town Hall. He, has a, he was a scholar in residence here, debuted his co-hosted podcast, Life of the, on, the, on the Margins here, and has been featured as a subject or an interviewer on a number of past events. And so, it is a special honor for Town Hall to host the launch of his latest work. It is a special honor for me, as his friend, to bring to you my friend, and in joining my friend on stage, Michelle Matassa Flores, and the, I don't think y'all ready. I'm, I'm gonna let y'all hold that for a second. No. And joining Michelle on stage tonight, the yeah. Marcus Harrison Green. Man, Sharon, thank you for that, that intro. You, you, I, you damn near had me running because I, I do not know if I can live up to all that. So thank you. Uh. <laughs> and I just want to say, I was standing back there wondering, why in the heck am I interviewing you? Why didn't you ask Sharon to do this? <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's got personality to spare for all of us. Um, and, and thank you, Sharon, wherever you are right now, for, for that humorous and, and really nice introduction of me. I'm sorry I'm a duck. I'd say tonight I'm a loyal Mariner fan. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, hard to be missing the game, actually, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored um, to be interviewing you tonight. Marcus, just like I'm honored to be editing you these days. It's, it's a pleasure. <laughs> 
We all agree. We yes. all. Yes. We all agree. Um, thanks to all of you for coming out. It's kind of strange to be uh, on a stage in, in front of a crowd. We were saying backstage, Marcus and I, that we haven't done this. We, I think you said three years for you. Yeah. Um, that's probably about right for me, too. I, it felt strange putting on um, pants with the waistband and all that. <laughs> um, so thanks for coming out. This is, this is a kick in so many ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so our plan tonight is to talk um, in front of you, basically, to carry on a conversation, which um, hopefully will be very engaging for you and for us um, for maybe 40 or 45 minutes and then open it up to questions, which I think you've You've um, had that explained to you how that works. Um, in, in the course of this conversation, Marcus will do a little bit of um, reading of some passages from his book. I would like to just warn everybody that there will be a little bit of um, profanity in that tonight. And we'll also be... <laughs> seem okay with that. <laughs> um, we'll also be discussing some pretty tough subjects, um, as, as those who follow Marcus's writing already know. Um, things will get real. We'll talk about mental illness and, and even suicide, and I, I feel like uh, you should know that ahead of time. Um, so Marcus, this book includes, uh, I, I counted 30 essays, yeah. um, published over uh, about eight years. They've run in at least five publications um, that, that I could think of, Seattle Weekly, South Seattle Emerald, of course, Crosscut, The Times, Bitterroot Magazine, um, and maybe some others, uh, and and also the, the book includes some speeches you've you've given. Um, the the themes, just to kind of recap for those who haven't um, read the collection of essays yet, um, they cover some some very topical and very heavy themes. Um, coming of age and, and evolution is one. Mental health, which I already mentioned, um, race and social justice and civil rights movements in all their forms. Uh, policing, family, including your grandparents and your parents, um, cynicism and the fear of it, which we'll get into, uh, going back to normal and how that would be a really bad move for many people in this society, and being black in America, which is related to all of that. Um, so very light topics today. Yes, we're, we're going to keep it light. Yes. <laughs> um, so my first question for you is, given all that publishing you've done, the speeches you've made, um, it's very clear that you are determined to have your voice be heard. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and ask you where that comes from and what, it keep, what keeps it going and what you're aiming to do with that. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, it comes from a variety of places, but if I, if I had to say with the overriding place, uh, I think it's m my grandfather, um, uh, Lenny Hinton. Uh, so I never met him before and all I ever had was memories that my mom would tell me about him. Uh, she only, the last time she saw him, she was 10 years old. So this is, uh, you know, nearly, you know, 66 years ago at this point. Um, and my grandmother, you know, never shared too much about him, but what I did know was that he was a writer who lived in Chicago, and he wanted to write and, and be a columnist for the paper there. I, I think at the Tribune at, at that time. Uh, it might have been another one. Um, and he spent his life's work, it was about five years of his life, writing uh, a book about the Great Wall of China. Uh, it was this black man who did all this research um, to write this you know, wow. book. And he sent it in to a publisher. Um, and he never heard anything back. Uh, and he's walking through uh, this bookstore in Chicago a year and a half later. And uh, he sees a book. And it has uh, this white author's name on it. Um, and he, uh, unfortunately, that situation destroyed him. And uh, he ended up drowning himself in alcohol. It was one of the reasons that my grandmother left him. Um, and, and moved out with uh, my mom and, and her brother at the time. And, uh, you know, the, the next time she saw him, he was just a very broken man. She just remembers that the last image of him is just um, extremely deflated and, uh, um, you know, never spoke to him really again. And so for me, 
Um, I don't necessarily always believe in vicarious redemption, but um, that's a story that keeps me going and is, and is dear to me because every time, uh, we'll get into this later, but you know how hard it is for me to write sometimes because of uh, the mental illness that I have and word recall can be tough and um, memory can be tough. And um, there are so many times where I just want to quit and I want to stop and um, there's a voice and it says to keep writing and to keep going. Um, and you know, I'm not a woo-woo type person. Obviously, there's an article in, the, in, in there about that. But um, I can't help but think that it's him saying to keep on and to press on. And um, I just don't, I know that he had a gift. And um, I don't want to cheat um, this gift that I have and this opportunity that I have and this responsibility that I have. Um, and so, you know, he's, he is a driving force. Do you feel like there's some cosmic balance you're trying to strike, or does this kind of avenge the loss he suffered? <sighs> Somewhat, right? I, I think it's also a learning from the past. Um, it's seeing the, the pain and trauma that can endure um, when, um, and justifiably, you know, so. He was in a really bad situation. He himself also had bipolar disorder, what my family believes. And so, in many ways, uh, I wanted to try to adopt a, a posture that was different um, from him in, in his life. It, like, sort of use it as a, not only a cautionary tale, but an inspiration. Um, and I think about that, how it, it binds, writing binds him uh, to, to me and, my, you know, and to my mother. And in, in some ways, you know, she still, to this day, saves everything that I write in her little, um, uh, <laughs> in her little gift box. And That's so awesome. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, she thinks uh, in some ways, you know, she's told me before that she thinks that he's inside of me somewhere, um, you know, proud. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't know where he's at. I'm not a believer in you know spirits and stuff like that. But um, you know, I, I believe in um, fulfillment and redemption and redemption, I guess. And so I try to just try to do the best that I can. And um, so. Well, we'll talk a little more in a bit about your family. Um, and Mama Green is a, is a good sidecar editor as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> We've, she supported me one time when I made an edit Marcus wasn't so sure about. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we, we are going to talk specifically about some of the pieces in the book, but I'm kind of curious before we launch into that what your favorite one is, if you can say, if you have a favorite. Lord, um... You know, all of them have a piece of me. Um, all of them are, are, are coming from uh, a very genuine and authentic place. I, I look at it like it, it, that speech um, in the movie Sideways about wine. Um, when I think it's Virginia Madsen. Um, she's, uh, she's talking about, she's doing this monologue about how when you open up wine on this day, it'll taste different from any other day. And so this is the day that it tastes the best, right? Because you know, it's, it's here, it's right now. And, and when I look at all these essays, you know, they were, you know, like that, that bottle of wine, right? I mean, they could only be written in that time period on that day. And so for me, it, it's, it's hard for me to pick uh, a favorite because I think it, I don't want to diminish uh, the taste <laughs> of the other ones. I was afraid you'd say something like that. You know me well. What can I say? <laughs> Not that I was afraid, but I had a feeling you would. Um, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that concept of, of the wine because we were talking about this earlier, how the, the essays um, reflect your, your frame of mind at any point in time. And, and I think it is important to keep in mind that that can shift over time just as history is changing and forming itself every day and every minute and every hour. Um, and so as we talk about these essays, you know, I think that's an undercurrent through it is, okay, for this particular thing you said, do you still feel that way? So I might ask that on right. occasion as we go. Um, one, one theme I noticed come up a lot in these essays, and honestly in, in the work we've done together too, is, is one of uh, self-hatred mm -hmm. and self-love and the tension between those. 
Um, so I think what I'd like to do is have you, Marcus, read a passage from one of your essays that relates to this, if you could, and then, and then I'll ask a question about this subject. Okay, well, I'm familiar with the material, so it shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this one is Self-Hatred and Self-Love, uh, Being Black in America. In first grade, I remember being told it was okay that I was stupid because God didn't intend to make people like me as smart as my other classmates, all of them white. When I was 13 years old, a police officer stopped me as I crossed the street near my home for the heinous crime of jaywalking so he could press my face into the hood of his car and whisper in my ear, uh, nigger, I'll rape your mother and there's nothing you can do about it. While in prep school, I was the only one to ever face punishment after fights with my white schoolmates. I never started these fights, but for the record, I did win most of them. <laughs> uh, when I made a six-figure salary working at a hedge fund in Los Angeles, I was told I was one of the decent ones. Marcus, my manager, joked, don't ever think we'll try to bring more of you in here. We don't want to be confused with Harlem. For me, it was easier to live in denial. I latched on to the grand American gospel that says every ill you face can be traced back to personal responsibility. I told myself that if I acted more politely, didn't have a chip on my shoulder, and adapted well to different circumstances, I'd be fine. I felt the need to act more passive and less threatening. I repeated this mantra so often that it became my truth. And that imprisoned me. It shackled me with self-hatred, and I began to extend those feelings toward my own race. Okay, thank you for reading that. I, I feel obligated to just sit here with it for a minute, and, and that's a lot to, to absorb. Um, I guess my question for you is, as readers of, of these essays seek to get to know you, and if you haven't, have, haven't read the book yet, it really is about all these big weighty subjects, it's also very much about getting to know Marcus and the life he's lived and what that says about society. So as people are trying to get to know you and, and you tell a lot of really tough stories like this one that you just read, uh, my question is, how did those experiences help shape the person you became? And how do they still? Yeah, I mean, I think like many people, uh, in, in you know black America when you are trying to make your way through these institutions uh, you kind of have this fashion bargain that you're presented with right and it's many times it's self advancement right at the expense of collective advancement or, or speaking out when you should or acting as authentically as you can right you sort of you get into a position where you begin to wallow in this illusion that progress means white, right? That being attached to the cultural hegemony that we have in this society means success. And it's hard many times to, to break that, right? Because you are constantly iterated, you know, through school, through interactions with police many times, through um, work, right? On what it means to not threaten the power base, right? What it means to simply shut up and, and grin and bear it and then you know you too can uh have all these riches but i think you begin to learn as you get older right that not everything that glitters is gold and so you walk you walk through these various circumstances and then you en encounter another um uh, another fork in the road and it's will you continue down the path that you are going are now that you sort of have this knowledge about what the reality is, will you take you know, the harder path, right? To be as authentic as you possibly can, to speak out when you need, when you, know, you need to speak out. Will you, and will you do the, the work to sort of recognize the, the things that are going on inside of you, in, 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 in your interior, right? The, the self-hatred and the self-loathing. And I think just rereading that now, I remember when I was in those situations for the longest time, 
you know, I hated myself for constantly being conciliatory, for constantly um, uh, selling out because I thought that was the sort of the best way to uh, advance myself and my family. And then as you get older, you learn to give yourself grace because you understand, you know, that this is something that we encounter all the time. And you and that's a part of healing, right? That's a part of um, knowing who you are. You can't have change without vulnerability. And so, um, you know, I, I look back at that time and that the person that I was then, um, like many people, still wanting to do the right thing, but doing it in the wrong way. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I look at here where I've arrived today, and it's a lot less lucrative. I don't have the six-figure salary. I'm not dating the yoga instructor and the <laughs> Pilates instructor and leasing the Maseratis. But, you know, I think I'm taking the number 106 back home. Did you lease a Maserati? I, at the time, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> Funny, that's never come up. I've never, I've never heard that. Well, I had to give you some good stuff today. I know. You know thank so. you for holding that up. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So you... you in spite of taking a pay cut to join journalism, which I totally relate to, I get that. Yeah. Um, you have kind of arrived in, in your own way. You're, you're here on the stage, you've got a book out, you're very well known um, locally and beyond. And so I'm wondering, do you still struggle with that, the, being your authentic self? Uh, I think, I don't necessarily struggle with being authentic. I think I, I struggle with sometimes with compartmentalization, um, all the things that I have to juggle. Um, there are times, right, with, you know, for instance, you know, I'm, when I'm with you, I'm, I'm in the position of being a writer. When I'm with the, the Emerald, I'm in the position of being the publisher and needing to, you know, try to pump people up and listen to their, um, you know, issues and, and problems and, and respond in a, in a very, um, uh, you know, constructive way. Um, when I'm with, you know, my family, they, they have certain needs. And so it's just trying to, it's trying to show up a, as you are in, in all of those positions, but also knowing what's needed in all of those positions. I guess I was thinking more specifically in the way of assimilating into a white dominant. Oh, no, no, yeah, I have no problem with that. <laughs> it's, I, I think I go back to, uh, I think I've told you the story once. Uh, you know, I, I'm a sucker for history because I'm a father. And there's, uh, during the Justinian period um, of the Byzantine Empire, there's King Justinian who, you know, this mediocre white dude who got all the credit, and it's really, it really was Theodora, his queen, that was doing everything. So, so not much has changed in 600 years. <laughs> But, uh, you know, there's these literally barbarians at the gate. And she's, uh, you know, Justinian wants to run and hide and throw down his crown and, you know, sneak out. And she's like, where are you going? And he's like, I'm, I'm not staying here. And she's like, I don't care what happens if they breach these walls. I, whether I live or I die, I'm going to do it as I am. And I always think uh, of that story whenever I'm in you know, certain situations, whether I live or I die or I have to turn down money from uh, some foundation or some uh, you know, huge business or whatever because it's not in line with my values and my integrity, I'm just gonna do it as I am. And I wanna be able to look at myself in the mirror. I wanna be able to have people in my life um, know that you know, what you see is what you get. And um, here I am. I love that, and, and I, I always feel like what I see is what I get when I'm with you. Um, uh, I also always feel really stupid when I'm with you because you know so much about history and culture and <laughs> literature, and he's always quoting things I have no idea. It's it little, should make me feel smarter, but it doesn't. It's a liberal yeah, arts education, and you did go to Oregon, so I, <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, <it's>, <laughs> Okay. I'm getting a cheap applause <laughs> line from folks. <laughs> I'm fine being the straight man here tonight. That's okay. Um, okay, another theme uh, that I've picked up on a lot in, in your book and in hanging out with you is um, what feels like a constant struggle to avoid becoming cynical mm. and to hang on to hope. Um, and, you know, it struck me when I, when I learned the title of your book, Readying to Rise, 
And I guess, um, you know, as I read moments where you were slipping into cynicism and trying to stay hopeful, it, it occurred to me to ask you, are you ready to rise? Yeah, I mean, I think like all of us, I think I'm rising every day, right? I mean, I think I, I look at life now as we are always in a state of becoming, right? Becoming sort of either better or, or, or regressing, um, whether it's you know, on a cellular, cellular level or psychological level. And that's why for me, I think just the fact, uh, I don't know, I, I guess I used to not call myself an optimist, but I think I do, you know, today. I, because I woke up this morning and so many other people did as well. Um, and you look, at, you look at the problems that we have in life. I mean, they're not created by magic, you know, <laughs> or some force of nature. Well, man-made problems aren't created by, you know, are, are created by, you know, men and, and human beings. And so for me, I look at it as, you know, wherever you have people, yes, you'll have tragedy and horror and trauma, but wherever you have people, you can also have the possibility of miracles. And so for me, it isn't necessarily hope that I hold on to. I think I hold on to possibility of what the world can be, you know, and knowing what my place is in it. You know, I, I, you know, I, I dream of spring in, in the way that I dream of what the world can be and knowing that potentially in my lifetime it won't be, become what I wish it to be. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't aid, it, aid its advancement in some way, you know, that I can't be a part of it becoming better. Um, and so that's the thing that animates me and, and drives me. I guess you wouldn't be doing what you're doing if you didn't. Yeah, it's definitely not the pay as we've, as we've discussed. <laughs> as we've covered, that's yes. right. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about civil rights activism. Um, in this collection of essays, you have uh, at least a couple pieces that, that deal with it. Um, you, you write about the Black Lives Matter movement um, in a couple different ways. Uh, you, you write about white people's participation in it and come, kind of coming to grips with that. That's my phrase, not yours. Um, you write about patriarchy in the civil rights movement, both historically and more recent and locally. Um, and I'm kind of curious as a writer uh, and truth teller, um, you know, how that has... Uh, played out and felt for you. You have a line in one of the essays that says, uh, why should we air out our dirty laundry in public? Maybe because that's the only way it'll ever get clean. Right. That really jumped out at me and, and I wondered, um, you know, after some of the things you have written, I, I wouldn't say they were critical of, of the movement or movements, mm -hmm. um, but questioning and, and introspective as you are with all things. So what was it like after writing those things? What did you get back? Uh, yeah, I mean, you get back various you know, feedback. There's some people who don't like to ever be called out for anything. There are other people who, who do. I mean, I just think whenever you're in the midst of change, a, a revolution or what have you, um, you have to, there has to be somebody there who can talk about how that change, you know, is made and what's going on. I mean, you look at, hell, you, know, you look at the French Revolution, right? I mean, it took them from when they, you know, first cut off the royals' heads to when they got a constitution. It's 90-something years, right? And, and that was because you had people, you know, not necessarily questioning what was going on or not being so, uh, a friend of mine, Michael Denzel Smith, says, we get so caught up sometimes with the boot that's on our neck that we forget to look down and see that our boot is on somebody else's neck. Mm. And I think that's, that's when I usually am, am writing uh, about social movements, that's the thing that I'm writing about. Um, because there is, uh, even with our civil rights movement, there was a, a history of erasure of women and, and queer folk. You have somebody like um, Anna Arnold um, Hegeman, who was instrumental in getting the white clergy to be at the March on Washington, and yet she wasn't allowed to be in the front. She wasn't allowed to speak, you know, she was barely, you know, recognized. And yet without her, right, you don't have all those people there. You have somebody like Bernard uh, Rustin who, because he was gay, um, you know, is oh, essentially washed out of civil rights history. And yet he was so instrumental in, you know, not the not, you know, Martin Luther King's nonviolence in terms of his stance and so forth. You know, everybody talks about Gandhi, 
which is true, but, you know, Rustin was also so instrumental in the formation of King, and yet we erase him for history. And so for us, it's, to me, it's, why not show the truth of everything, right? I mean, because this is going to take solidarity with all of us. And so we can't put, you know, we can't put these people on the sideline who have done so much work and continue to do so much work. So this is one of those topics where I think um, thoughts can shift as history changes, right? And I'm curious, after the past year and a half we've been through, and 2020 especially with all of the, the protests following George Floyd's murder, uh, what, what's on your mind now about Black Lives Matter and civil rights movements locally and, and beyond? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways uh, disappointment from how it, it was very hopeful, like many people, that there would be sort of, when we talked about this racial reckoning, that it would be time for some level of extreme, you know, systemic change. And, and while I, I think we have had um, changes, I, I think nationally they continue to sort of be around the margins. Um, you know, I, the recent poll that I, that I saw it showed that, you know, support for black lives amongst the white folks it dropped to what they were essentially pre George Floyd levels, um, and, and I don't know, it's, I think my therapist said like no one's ever gone broke uh, <laughs> um, betting on, you know, white supremacy re returning in, um, you know, America. And so uh, I think that's where I, I have sort of an air of disappointment. You just wish that there would be more sustained change and, and, and more consistent change and there would be more consistent reflection that it shouldn't take a pandemic and a grotesque, you know, video of a man being killed uh, for people to to wake up and and stay awake. Do you think that, like, what's going to come next? I guess is my question. Not that you have all the answers. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know that there will be sustained. But there will be, you know, sustained activism. There will be sustained writing around things. I, I guess I don't do this thing. You know, I don't. I don't write, and and because I believe that tomorrow things are going to change, I write because it, words need to be said, and words need to be written, and and actions need to be taken, and, and whether they are or not, it's like T. S. Eliot said, right? The trying is all we have, and the rest is not our business. And so I just make it my business to try. So in founding the South Seattle Emerald, as I think Sharon mentioned in her introduction, um, a big part of your motivation was to tell a story that you believed wasn't being told. And, um, and here I sit you know, under a banner of the Seattle <laughs> Times, but I, I want to bring up the subject of the lack of diversity in, in mainstream media, um, both staffing and coverage, but I'm really thinking of coverage now. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is more of an invitation to you to let us have it. <laughs> um, I know you have thoughts about this subject. <laughs> uh, I, I do, and I, I know we've had conversations about this in yes. the past. Um, no, I mean, I think for me, and, and what I'm sort of focused on now is really just the pipeline and, and how we get more folks of color involved with journalism. I was talking to somebody the other day and she said, look, she's not going to go into debt for $70,000 or, or however much, you know, to go to a four-year college and then come out and maybe there's a job for her and maybe if there is one, it pays $35,000. And so, you know, for, for me, and I know we've had this discussion, you know, how do we find a way that we can get more folks involved where it, it isn't cost prohibitive and that we can, you know, come go there and be there for folks who are, you know, in BIPOC communities. You know, what do we set up? Is that a trade school? Is that working with some of the community colleges? Is that um, certificate accreditation? Um, I don't know, but I know what it, we have now isn't working. Um, it's there's a reason why there's, you know, an overrepresentation of white males in this industry, um, and there's a reason why many people say, that, you know, we. I can't do this work unless I happen to be married to an image, uh, engineer at Amazon or whatever. Um, so what is that going to, how, how is that going to leave our media ecosystem, right? If most of the people then who can afford to actually do media are 
affluent or belong to a very rich, affluent class, then what kind of journalism is being done? So, yeah. There's a passage in one of your essays that I'll read. It's a short one. Uh, you say, because our media in its everyday coverage, just like our society, is dominated by a narrative that centers whiteness. The experiences of the dominant, read white, group in our society are taken to be universal, empirical reality and a baseline for how others are to be perceived and evaluated, even as it masquerades as objectivity. What, um, I'm, I'm trying to formulate the question here, but I'm curious what we need to be doing better in mainstream media um, that would bring the stories to light out of communities of color, underrepresented communities, those you set out to cover with the South Seattle Emerald. I mean, I don't want to give you the Emerald secret sauce, but I'll... Uh, Are you sure? No, I... <laughs> I think, and I'm just going off of what you know. People will tell us when we're um, when I'm, you know, sifting out the, the the hate emails we we get from one individual in particular. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but no, I I think most people say this is journalism that I can see myself in. That is reflective of the world that I live in. Right. This is reflective of this place. I, I feel that this is journalism that's lived in, and it isn't somebody just parachuting in, or it isn't somebody who spends most of their time in an office building and haven't walked the same streets that I've walked. And it's not, this was before your tenure at the Times. Um, and I remember writing a piece uh, about um, Mary Flower, uh, Mary, uh, uh, this man, Michael Flowers, who was killed, his mother was Mary Flowers, and she had asked me to write a piece about something that had appeared uh, in the Times. And I remember saying um, in the piece that she didn't want him to be treated as a saint. He had died on a, in a home invasion uh, when somebody uh, invaded into the, the place that he was at. And I said he didn't, not asking that he be treated like a saint, not at all, because no one is, but it just asked that he be treated like a human with the contours of humanity. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's the thing that we can all do better at. You know, I'm certainly not going to say that my organization is perfect. It isn't. It's just trying to we just try to collapse the distance between where we are and, you know, what, where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Very fair and yeah. very excellent point. Okay, because that was such a light subject and all these <laughs> others have been. Let's talk a little bit about mental health yeah. um, generally and specifically your mental health. Yeah. Um, you wrote a column after Naomi Osaka um, about out of the tennis tournament. Gosh, was it the U.S. Open? Yeah, the U.S. Open. Um, and we, Marcus and I have, uh, that was kind of a moment for us in the writing and editing of that column um, was was a tough one, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, our relationship status would read it's complicated, I think, if yes. that was in that particular... Yeah. yeah, and it got more so that <laughs> those days, and right. I think got deeper. I think that's fair to say, yes. probably. Um, and, you know, I thought that I knew a lot already at that point about your um, struggles. Yeah. And then when you turned in that column and I read it, it kind of knocked me back. I think I told you that later, because you revealed some things in there, including what was going through your mind before and after you came to me and we spoke about, about your mental health and a, and a diagnosis. And I, it, I was flabbergasted, as I think you can tell now, right. I still am. <laughs> um, would you like to read a passage from that column? Yeah. Why don't certainly. you do that and then we can talk a little more. All right. Three years ago, fear of jeopardizing my career nearly stopped me from telling my editor at the Seattle Times that I needed an extended break. I'd been employed there less than a year. I broke down in tears in her office. I'd already broken down mentally weeks prior. I expected her ridicule. She instead offered her support. With her blessing, I temporarily relocated to Fort Worth, Texas to recoup. There, I could walk the streets anonymously with no obligation to do anything but heal. 
It provided the perfect sanctuary for a mind that became a boomerang of torment. My brain ceaselessly shrieked that I was unlovable, unworthy, and grotesque. The loop of self-devaluation was one of the reasons I contemplated suicide on more than one occasion, including the night I walked out of my editor's office. Despite all evidence to the contrary, I felt I'd let her and my entire community down. In my mind, all the naysayers who believed a black man without a traditional journalism background could never cut it in a big city newspaper had been proven correct. I plummeted it into depression. So there's uh, a lot in there that strikes me still and struck me when I first read it um, because simply because I thought I knew a lot and I realized how much I still didn't know about what you were wrestling with. Yeah. I didn't know, for instance, that you were thinking about suicide the very night you left my office. Um, I didn't know, and I felt, in hindsight, incredibly stupid and naive for not thinking about the fact that you would worry that I and we in the newsroom and your broader readership would think, well, there's a black man who can't cut it. I mean, that cut deep when I read that, and then I felt like a complete idiot for the fact that it did strike me so, so raw, because that's just my own privilege, I guess, to not realize that would be a thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you've been dealing with, you know, after being, well, before and since being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, how you make that, how you get your work done? Yeah. Um, in spite of that, and just how universal struggles of the of mental health are, and uh, you know, when when you first came to me, uh, one of the first things I think I told you was that I've had this in my own family. Right. Um, you know, multiple people in my family, some quite close to me, and I think as I've talked to people about that long before knowing you, it, you just start to realize how many people are dealing with this. Yeah. Um, it, you, there's no six degrees of separation. It is right there for everybody. Yeah. No, I mean, it's... I tell people this all the time. I, I don't try to romanticize mental illness. You know, if I was, you know, if, the, if I was at the, I guess, the selection tray of, uh, you know, when, when fully being formed and somebody was like... Uh, you can be incredibly handsome and then also get, you know, have bipolar disorder with the side of it. I, I would just have chose incredibly handsome. I would not have chose the <laughs> bipolar disorder. But um, no, but it's it's not easy to live with. It sucks, um, and that's why I think I, I ran away from it and the, the diagnosis for so long, for so many years. Um, I had been diagnosed um, earlier than when I accepted accepted it. Um, people. I, I just didn't want to, it was that fear, uh, again, of how people would accept you, and knowing that this was something that I'd have for the rest of my life, knowing that I'd have to take medication that um, didn't always necessarily interact well with my kidneys, knowing that I would have to, to change, couldn't be that hard driving person all the time, um, and knowing that I'd have to depend on other people and trust other people. Um, I just the, the backstory of actually writing this, uh, uh, this piece and how it actually came about. It wasn't supposed to, um, this wasn't my initial idea to write about, it. as you know. Um, it was, I think I was doing a piece on transformative justice and it was just not coming together. And I'm at, uh, uh, I think I was on vacation for my birthday and I'm at this like oh, that's right. seedy hotel in Berkeley, um, only because that's what I could afford for no other reason. <laughs> and um, I'm on the phone with you and I'm, like, you know, Mitch, what do, you know, what, <laughs> what do I do, essentially? And I'm going to, and I think he said, look, we'll just, you know, we, we'll just, we just won't, you know, publish something. And I was like, no, here I am. I'm letting her down again. Um, I, you know, I'm, it's, you know, I'm, yeah. It was one of those moments when you just come face to face, right, with, um, who you actually are and, and, and what's going on with you in terms of your mental health. And um, I remember working through the night. Uh, I think I was up until oh. six in the morning, 
to hand this into you. And I was, you had already spent so much work on the, um, the previous piece that again, I didn't want to, to disappoint you. And I remember <laughs> the next morning you were editing it and I was crying on the phone hysterically. Um, I just lost sort of my bearings. And uh, um, I can't tell you enough how much you need support with, with mental illness, right? I don't know if I did. If I didn't have an editor like you, how much I would have been able to, you know, continue to, to want to write all these times that I've given up. And I, I think with you, you always say, you know, just give me your best this day and whatever your best is. If it's, you can't run anything because you're in a state, then okay. If it's, you know, what you were able to, to, um, to craft, then okay. Um, but for me, it, you know, coming out to, to you, coming out to my family, with uh, coming out to my friends, that was just one of the hardest things, and it continues to sometimes be hard um, because I wonder if people will, if that's what they see when they when they see me. Um, it's hard many times to be uh, on dates with folks and everything's going great, and then you tell them, and then you don't get a phone call back, um, and you you're just kind of searching through life, wanting to be affirmed, and you know, affirmed for all you are. And I think having a uh, mental illness has showed me the importance of having a loving community who accepts you for all your faults um, and all you are. And it's not easy to cultivate that many times, but it's very necessary. Well, it would have been really great of me to just say, I don't care if you're crying, just get that column done. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I do remember thinking, I, it wasn't even a conscious thought, really, but just I, the I wasn't even aware anymore that we had a column to work on, right? right? And and that's being just a friend and a human being and a mother and a daughter and every a wife, you know, everything uh, about being a human being. It's you hear that over the phone and it's you just go into how can I help you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I I wonder. You know, you've been brave in writing about that. We talked about being your authentic self. I mean, you're so brave writing about this subject and how personally you do that. You're here talking about it tonight, telling that story. Um, I'm, I'm imagining that you must get a lot of response to that, and, and I would hope that would be gratifying. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, and I think with that particular column, I think that was the most... Um, email, uh, positive email, I'll say, that I, that I received. Um, I've certainly received my fair share of negative email, but that <laughs> in particular, I, I don't think that I received one, at least not directly. Um, and it was just people saying, yeah, yeah, I deal with this too. And thank you for, for naming this and giving me, um, letting me know that I'm not alone. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I think it's James Baldwin who said it, you write to know that you're not alone. And that's... <laughs> I definitely agree wholeheartedly with that. Well, and hopefully by writing about it, uh, you can help destigmatize uh, mental illness, mental health struggles that people have. Yeah. I commend you for that. Let's, well, I started to say let's lighten it up a little bit, but that's, this won't exactly lighten things up. Yeah, I don't so, do light. I just, no, yeah, I I, yeah <laughs> that's kind of the thing. Um, but I want to talk about family. Your yeah. family, um, you write a fair amount about them. You talk about them a lot with me, and so yeah. lovingly. I've I kind of feel like I know your family much more than I have a right to feel that way. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, you're, I always feel kind of sorry for your dad because you talk about your mom so much. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but that's okay. Moms deserve it as a mother. Yes. I, would, yeah. I would say. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about a piece you, you wrote about your grandmother, though. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe, maybe you can read us a passage um, from, from this piece, and then we can talk a little bit about family and what it means to you. Yeah, this, this particular essay was, uh, um, it was written on the heels of my grandmother passing away. Um, for a time period, I was um, one of her, helped out as one of her caretakers. Um, and so it was just a way to to try to process that and, and what she had meant to me. Um, and so the, the name of the piece was When Your Only Hero Falls. Um, it's this woman who, 
when I was nine years old, stopped in the middle of cooking dinner to calmly load her shotgun as if it was her garden seed dispenser to protect the grandson who had just blown into her house to hide from gang members who had been terrorizing the neighborhood. They were non-discriminatory in putting young and old alike in the hospital. While everyone else locked their doors, she walked from hers, her flowery apron accessorized by a double barrel, and announced she would kill every last one of you motherfuckers if you dare lay a finger on my grandson's head. Uh -huh. With my heart racing and hers is mellow, she returned to fixing supper while my pursuers made themselves scarce and asked, are you hungry? <laughs> That's the indelible impression of my grandmother I'll always carry. There was never anything life could concoct that she couldn't abide on her own terms or amend with some straining of her will. It's this woman who I never saw cry, no matter how many of her siblings and children she placed in graves, and who I never saw admit to pain of any kind, no matter how tormenting. It was her demeanor that seemed to feed so generously into the juvenile notion that we have of our heroes. They are infallible, and therefore incapable of hurting to the levels the rest of us do. It's impossible for them to be like us, to be weak, to fall, because then who would we have to lean on? Who else would cushion our descents? I just absolutely love that. It might be my favorite passage in the book. Um, I'm kind of curious because we've heard a bit about your grandfather now and, mm -hmm. and mom and dad and now grandma. What parts of you come from which of your family members? Can, can you, is it easy enough to lay that out? I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of a buffet. I, <laughs> I, um, I, I would say maybe counterintuitively, you know, those, those moments that I um, really sort of, I think, you know, I'm pretty easygoing Pacific Northwest person. But those moments, right, when you need to stand firm and, and stick to your guns, I think I get those from my grandmother. Um, Stick to your shotguns? Yeah, there you go. Um, and I think, you know, oddly enough, when it came to showing tenderness and, and, and kindness, um, I mean, I, yeah, I get that from my mother, but I think also my father, you know, he showed me what it meant to continue to evolve as somebody who was, uh, you know, he's a military man, um, yet as, as a person who had to accept so much in, in his life from you know, his son with the bipolar diagnosis to um, so many other things with his own siblings in, in terms of um, having to question what it meant to, you know, be, uh, quote unquote, a man. Um, he's the person who I see uh, in terms of that it's never too old to change, it's never too old to become the person who you were always capable of becoming. Um, and so I get that notion from him, I'd say. When you left your job in finance to become a writer, journalist, start the Emerald, you moved back in with them, right? I did, yeah. And I you was were at in your 30-something in my mother and father's basement, okay. legitimately, yeah. I was How not getting a lot of dates then either. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. What was that like? How long did it go on? Because and, and, you're not still living with them. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. I've, I've moved on <laughs> up a bit. It's in a basement, but it's somebody else's that I pay for. So. <laughs> <laughs> and who had grandma's shotgun at the time? No. That's what I wanted. <laughs> my, my dad still has that. <laughs> yeah, okay. anyway. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was tough. I mean, they, as parents even, um, I know I had to deal with a lot of ridicule of your son just gave up this lucrative job um, for what? For to start some newsletter? Like, and you guys are allowing this. You need to talk some sense into him. And even though, you know, my dad, he sat me down and he talked to me and he said, is this what you really want to do? And, and, and tell me, like, tell me that it is and, and tell me that there is no going back. Because um, if you are willing, because he said the difference, there's a difference between sacrifice and uh, commitment, you know. And commitment is, you know, I'm going to try my best and if it doesn't work out, then hey, whatever. And sacrifice is, nah, you're just going to have to kill me, mother effer. I'm not, you know, I'm not <laughs> going to let this go. And he said, if this is a sacrifice you're willing to make, then we're willing to make the sacrifice too. Um, and so I told him that it was. And, you know, eight years later, um, I'm here with you. And we have the emerald. And um, here we are. So. Yay. <laughs> Yay. 
Okay, so let's, let's talk about one more um, little topic here, and then we can move into audience questions. Right. And that is um, the, the notion of a call to action. Mm -hmm. uh, you frequently in your writings, you do call on people to do things. And they're often small things, or they're internal things. You know, you call on people to think about who they are and how they behave and act yeah. and treat people, most importantly. Um, and so, you know, if you're not calling on people to do big, sweeping activism, you do call on them quite a bit. Readying to Rise is obviously, you know, all about that, the title of this book. Um, so I'm wondering if you want to just maybe close out this portion of the evening by reading from from the essay called Superman Taught Me the Most, Taught Me Most of What I Know About Life. Yeah, sure. Um, my mom will tell you that I should have went with Wonder Woman, but I was, you know, it was 2013 when I wrote this I essay. Knew I loved so her. I just, uh, <laughs> as admirable as these acts are, I have no delusions that they alone are enough to alter the course of our world. No one action, no one person can. What they function as, just like any act that encroaches upon all the darkness that surrounds us, is sparks. A reminder that this world, no matter how dim it may seem to us, contains illuminating possibilities. These acts that we pursue as individuals, when taken together, feed the flame that dares to oppose all that is evil around us. It is at this point when we discover that we actually share a great deal with the fictional Superman. Like him, we sense that we live in a place that is so desperately in need of saving. And like him, we encounter a decision of great importance. We can pretend to be as meek and as mild as Clark Kent when he puts on his glasses, going on about our lives, masking our true selves, hiding amongst the anonymity, afraid to stand out as we acquiesce to our imagined weaknesses. Or we can take a hard look at ourselves, as I'm sure we often do knowing that there is more inside of us than what we allow the world to see, more than that we can accomplish than what others expect of us. And in recognizing this, we can stand tall and remove our glasses, revealing to the world who we are, who we truly are, along with what we are truly capable of. Very well said. Thank you. Okay, I have the magic iPad with questions coming in from the audience, both uh, here and virtually, I believe. Um, I don't have the instructions at the top of my head, but I do believe you were uh, told how to do that if you want to submit questions. So please feel free to continue sending them in, and I'll kind of dig in. Right. Ready, Marcus? Ready, let's go. Okay. Do you, Marcus, have a favorite or treasured story of hope? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to whittle it down, I guess. Um, it's just top of mind because I recently um, was emailed with her, but uh, there's a, a kinship caregiver who I wrote about, and kinship caregivers are grandmothers who are raising their biological grandchildren because, uh, for whatever reason, the biological parent is not in the picture. Um, and Ali Rees was, I believe, 76 years old, and uh, took on the duties of raising her uh, 12 and eight year old grandchildren. And uh, remember her just, when I was interviewing her, she was talking about how sometimes it is just so hard at that age, and especially with COVID, especially with um, being so uh, just isolated, um, you know, and, and in quarantine with her children, with her, that's what she calls them, her grandchildren. Um, and that there's many times where she's had to just try to endure every day. Uh, you know, many times where she didn't want to endure every day. And uh, I remember writing about her just as a example of what was going on with kinship caregivers here in Washington State, how they didn't get the same amount of um, support as uh, of folks who were in uh, foster care parents. Um, and lo and behold, there's so many people I started to write in with checks for Ali Reeves, and somebody, you know, randomly just gave, you know, five thousand dollars to her so she could uh, pay off her uh, grandson's braces. 
And there's a person now who, you know, $200 from the retirement goes to her every single month. Um, it was just, to me, an, an example of the things we do and write about matters. And that if you give people opportunity to make a difference, then they, they can. Um, now, was that a story that was about, uh, you know, City Hall malfeasance or, uh, you know, will that take down, you know, some, um, you know, uh, a mayor or what have you? No, but, um, <laughs> but in that, in many ways, it is that much more important, right? Because it is, you know, people coming together to to do the right thing. So, um, there are days where I grow very cynical, where you see so many other folks doing <laughs> the wrong thing, and yet here, these are people, many of them wanting to stay anonymous, just to do what is right and to go on about their business. Mm -hmm. I loved that story. It, yeah. it really struck me the same way, and, and, and the reaction to it was very heartwarming. Yeah. Have you talked to her recently? Yeah, just via email. She's doing okay. So, okay. Yeah. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, when did you find time to write, and what pushed you to write? We've covered a little bit of that, but there's some a kind of new angle in there in that question. <laughs> Uh, there are very uh, many highly caffeinated days, I'll say. <laughs> um, I, I think the thing about writing for me is that I, I love to do it. I mean, even as hard as it is. So it's not as stressful as it can be sometimes. It's something that I, I, I love to do. I love to go to the, the park and just be with myself and with my notebook and, and just write. Um, remember the, the piece that I wrote about George Floyd, right, right in the aftermath? reason I was able to get that out so quickly was just to sit, you know sitting down with my notebook and I wrote it and then essentially just transcribed it and and there it was and so for me I mean I think like anything you make time for the things that you really love and enjoy in life um, and I don't have the easiest of schedules right now but um, I mean as you know I, I can't <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've promised to have uh, <laughs> something to you on time <laughs> and it's been two days later I promise I promise Mitch I'm gonna have it Sunday I'm gonna have the column Sunday for you this time I said as long as it's there by the time I wake up Monday morning <laughs> but no um, so yeah I mean uh, with me it's just trying it's just making the time uh, for it so have you had to give up anything else you still get to the gym once in a while here and there, um, yeah. I definitely have had to sacrifice a social life, but, I, but I have, as I said, I don't have too many dates, so it's, you know, it doesn't, doesn't eat into that too much. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. You see friends, I'm aware. Go on walks. Yeah. Marcus me. introduced me to my new favorite cocktail, the Brown Derby. I highly recommend it. Yes. I, I don't know if our favorite bartender, uh, Ben Doherty, is here tonight, but he, he said he was coming, so. I don't know. Maybe he's, maybe he's at Zigzag. He I've been looking for one better in town just for fun ever since I had his. He's still the best. There you go. Okay. Um, for as much as mental illness is a burden, have you ever found it to be a gift to your writing or to your view of the world? Yeah, I think sort of the silver lining, if you will, um, has been that it, it has a sort of allowed me to be more empathetic um, because when you're going through situations where you're dealing with mania or depression. Um, yeah, you've never had depths of despair so, so deep, but you've also you know, never had a, sort of an experience of, of love and euphoria <laughs> for yourself and for, for other people um, as well. It, it helps you to, in some ways, it's helping me to see farther and go, and, and go deeper in my writing and to also be kinder to myself and to other people, um, to have a bit of grace, to also look at people and realize, you know, when they're going through whatever they're going through, uh, it's that saying, right? You, you d be careful with your judgments of people because you don't know what battles they themselves are fighting. And so I try to lead with that first, right? I, I try to lead with grace. Um, even when, and, and you know this with some of the comments that I'll get on my pieces, uh, <laughs> I try to look at the person as a human being first and realize, you know what, maybe they're just lashing out because, you know, whatever else is going on in their, their lives. It doesn't mean that I'm going to respond in a, you know, <laughs> positive way, but I do try to, um, at the very least, um, realize that ultimately, um, you know, we are here for each other as, as human beings. And so, um, you know, I, 
I try to lead with, again, with grace and, and their humanity. I love lead with grace. That's a great phrase. My husband accused me in a bad way tonight of giving people too much benefit of the doubt when we were driving here. It was a bad <laughs> driving situation. He wasn't giving that person the benefit of the doubt. Um, how do you see racial justice and especially Black Lives Matter and policing reform playing out in the Seattle elections? It's a good one. Good. Yeah, I, was, I was hoping to run out the clock to not have to answer that. Uh, <laughs> How much time do we have? No. Uh, I, I mean, I think like anything, um, you know, I think there will definitely be, um, that there will definitely be uh, statements uh, around it and, and statements around police reform and so forth. Um, again, I mean, I think it's the Andrew Carnegie line. I've, uh, I've, I've gotten old enough to stop listening to what people say and to start looking at what people do. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'm ho hopeful, I guess, in the sense that <laughs> just because they're one way or the other, there's going to be change at City Hall. Uh, that being said, you know, uh, I don't know if there will be any level of systemic change. But again, I mean, I, I think we maybe put too much emphasis on our elected officials in that way. Ultimately, right, they wake up for us every day. They go to, you know, 4th, 1000 and 4th Avenue for us every single day. And so I'm less, I guess, concerned about what they do and I'm more concerned about what we do. How do we, you know, continue to push them? How do we continue to make sure that our voices are heard? How do we continue to hold them to their promises? Um, that's, those are things that are up to us, not, not necessarily them. Okay. We'll see you here in a year. Let's do this again. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I have volume two out. <laughs> um, I think maybe time for one more question. Okay. Um, and I like this because it follows up on something I alluded to, but so briefly that it might have left people confused. The question is, how do you see returning to normal in Seattle as bad for many? Now, mm. I think when I was referring to your writing about normal, um, it, it had to do with essays about things like kids going back into the classroom. Mm -hmm. For children of color, for instance, that's not always a pleasant place to be. Uh, right. So what normal is might depend on who you are. So do you want to talk a little bit about returning to normal? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, the thing that I would be scared of is us you know, returning sort of to this, this myth of you know, Seattle is just this fully progressive place where racism doesn't exist, and you know, and there's sort of this window dressing many times around um, you know racial justice in terms of people knowing the right phrases to say, but not necessarily having the courage to do the right things. Um, you know, I I just want us to, you know, I have a complex re relationship with the city. I, there's the city of my birth and I always am threatening to leave, but I, I never will, I never will. <laughs> All right, but um, I wanted to earn his reputation, right? I, I think there's so many of us who think that just because you enter into the city limits of this place that racism, it doesn't exist. But you know, if you do a taste test in terms of, if you look at the racial outcomes of our children, if you look at the, the racial outcomes in terms of socioeconomically and so forth, and, and you just put those in line with many other cities, whether it's you know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or Brownsville, Texas, or whatever, you know, unfortunately, we would have, you know, we wouldn't fare too well. And so, for me, in terms of going back to normal, is that I just don't want us to continue to wallow in this illusion of patting ourselves on the back for a reputation that we haven't really earned recently. Okay, and and I hope that kind of got to that person's question when we picked up on that in, in the right way. But I, I think you've been, you've raised um, some excellent points about that along the way in your, in your columns that I've been editing lately. And I'm sure you will continue doing that. And I appreciate that about you. I think uh, your voice is a really important one in, in this city and in society broadly, Marcus. And so I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for um, what you what you say to the readers of the Seattle Times, that's my personal uh, pitch and, and self-interest. Um, but what you're saying to all kinds of people through your writing, your public speaking, this book, and events like this one tonight. 
And I just quickly, I, I want to thank you, Mitch. I know um, I'll say it in, 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 in private. I say it in private many times, but I do want to say it in public. Um, you know, you've just shown me the value of um, being myself and of what it, of how mighty love can be. Um, you know, you get these, you know that your family and, and friends are there to love you, um, but you know, there's times where, uh, like when I was in your office that time, when I didn't know whether I wanted to live or die, and uh, having somebody um, in your life who believes in you um, and who go to battle with you, and I know sometimes we've been on the opposite side <laughs> of battles, but um, knowing that they are there, uh, thick and thin, um, it means a lot, and it just reiterates that no one can get through life alone and um, without, you know, some measure of love. And it, um, I know you have a, a different way than, than my mother or, <laughs> or my dad or other people, but um, it's always appreciated. And so thank you for helping me to become who I am today and um, continuing to help me rise. And I'm grateful for that. So thank you. That's nice of you to say. <laughs> and, you know, Every human being deserves to be loved, but it helps that you're so lovable. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. It's, it's been such a joy and a pleasure, I think, for both of us to, to have this conversation with real people in a real room that's physical. Yes. <laughs> uh, and to those who've joined us virtually, that's also great. Um, I think we wanted to, to just end, end the night on a note of, um, of not just thanks and appreciation, but asking you to continue supporting the cause of journalism and writing. Uh, where you could subscribe to either of our publications, subscribe to the Seattle Times or donate to the South Seattle Emerald. Um, we also have copies of Marcus's books um, book over in the corner there. Yeah, we'll be He'll doing be a signing. signing for a half hour. So, Most importantly, please continue to um, read and inform yourselves and enlighten yourselves and those around you because that's, um, that's what makes a difference in the world. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, so they, you can, I, my preference is that you, if you are going to get the book, that you get it from an independent bookstore, especially our local independent bookstores like Third Place Books and uh, Elliott Bay Books. Um, They're selling it online. If you must go to Amazon, it is also available there. So, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.